Um, so I want to welcome you on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, uh, to this uh, conversation on art and social change. Uh, uh, it's being co-sponsored by the Africa Program, which I represent, uh, Steve McDonald, the director of the Africa Program, uh, the Environmental Change and Security Program here, the United Nations Population Fund, which has several representatives around the table, and the Communications Consortium and Media Center. Um, uh, I want to uh, specifically say uh, a welcome on behalf of Jeff DeBelko, who heads the environmental program, who couldn't be with us today. He's in uh, Tokyo, Japan, so it's a little far commute for him. It wasn't the snow at all. Um, and also, just to give a brief, uh, our, our little blurb that we were always required to give at the beginning, that uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center is, uh, is of course, the official monument to uh, President Woodrow Wilson, who you all know was our only true academic as a president, although Bill Clinton might dispute that as an Oxford fellow, but, uh, but uh, the only one with a PhD and was, a, was the president of Princeton University, obviously, and, and a very, very uh, legitimate academic in his own right. I, I just recently visited his museum down in his birthplace in Staunton, Virginia, and, and, and I'd recommend it to people because it's surprising how much he did write and how prolific he was as an academic. But he believed very strongly in the bringing together of the world of, of uh, policy and the world of ideas, um, bringing together those who make policy with those who, who are field practitioners and experts and academics and, and who live out in that real world that they're making policy about. And I think today is a really good example of bringing a couple of people here who, who are indeed involved in that real world and witnessing uh, the kinds of... Um, tragedies and events and environment in which we uh, in which the majority of the world has to uh, uh, has to uh, abide um, our speakers today are uh, uh, Lindsay Adario uh, all the way down on my right she's going to discuss the work that she's been doing she's she's a uh, I, I'm not giving their full bios because I think you have that in front of you but as you see she's a photojournalist who's living in uh, India now in New Delhi, and she's going to discuss the work she's been doing in conflict zones in Afghanistan, Congo, Darfur, Turkey, and its impact on uh, women and, and, and girls. I, I think she's uh, just recently back from Sudan, too. The photos out front are ones that she has taken. I'm, I'm intrigued because my wife is a midwife from uh, South Africa who, uh, who did a lot of work in, uh, in uh, the, the squatter camps of Crossroads and in the, uh, and the townships on the flats of the Cape and, and in Soweto and other places. And uh, she would, uh, she would uh, really uh, resonate to a couple of those photos there of women giving birth. Uh, and situations that she's, uh, she's been very involved in. Our second speaker is Jane Sachs, immediately to my right here, um, uh, who, is, um, uh, who is with the uh, Ellen Stone Bell Institute for the Study of Women and Gender in, in Arts and Media, which is in uh, Columbia College in uh, Chicago. And she's going to discuss the work that uh, they have been doing on, uh, um, uh, in, at the Institute as a national and international creator of original works and collaborator of multidisciplinary programming and initiatives on the discourse on gender, culture, creativity, and community. Um, I'm going to turn it right over to them. We're going to have our, our normal culture here. That is, they will give presentations for about 15 or so minutes each, and the, we hope to devote the bulk of the time uh, to interaction with you and questions and answers and your own comments. Uh, when we do that, I'll moderate and ask you to identify yourselves and wait for the microphone to come around because we are being webcast live, and so you don't want to get ahead of your, your 15 minutes of seconds, seconds of fame there. Uh, but one last comment on my part, uh, just to... Uh, uh, to sort of give my own bona fides for even being up at this panel uh, with these, these two remarkable women uh, uh, because I have spent a little time in some conflict zones and some, uh, some, some areas of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, trauma and, and horror that I think that, uh, that uh, Lindsay is, is, is documenting. Uh, I was a combat soldier in Vietnam in 1967 and 68, and I've, I've spent 40 years in Africa, uh, including being in Uganda during the Idi Amin years uh, at the time of that coup, uh, being in South Africa from 76 to 1980 during the height of the apartheid era, and seeing the kind of deprivations and, and horror that has existed in those societies, and, and particularly as it's impacted women and children. Uh, also, uh, the programs that some of you know that we're running at the Woodrow Wilson Center in terms of post-conflict reconciliation, peace building, and, and, and uh, collaborative capacity building are directed at uh, conflict societies like Burundi, DRC, and, uh, and, and Liberia. And, and working uh, also intimately in, in Sudan and other areas, uh, particularly out in the eastern DRC. Uh, so, so I feel a little bit akin to our speakers today as we begin. So I, I, I don't even know what order we've chosen to go. So, uh, okay. Jane is going to start. 
Thank you very much, and, um, and definitely your work is at the center of a lot of the work that Lindsay and I do. So it's really a pleasure that you're here um, moderating the conversation. I, I, I've, pre I've prepared something a little longer than 15 minutes, so I will be cutting and chopping. Um, and, you know, as we go along, you might. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I know I'm not a real rules girl, but, um, but I, I want to thank all of you for being here today. And um, I want to thank you for the work that you do. Um, it's part of a, a wider ecology and constellation of work. And the work that Lindsay and I do would not have the value or the impact if we weren't in collaboration with a lot of the things that you all do. And um, I want to thank all of the organizations who brought us together, and um, especially UNFPA, who has been an incredible support of the Institute and our work. Um, we're really lucky to be able to spend time addressing the relationship between culture production, social practice, peace and security, and strategies to affect change through art. Um, it's often something that is not talked about. Um, it's, it's seen as an accessory and something that makes life better and easier, um, but it isn't always seen as an essential tool. And so I'm really appreciative that today it is seen that way. Also to have Lindsay here is um, such a gift, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen her work in periodicals and then also on your way in, and you'll be seeing a lot more of her work. Um, she is a very um, courageous and unusual artist and photojournalist. So as Steve said, I'm the director of the Institute, and um, we, we investigate the intersection between gender, culture, community, and creativity through all the arts. And we were established in 2005, and it's the first of its kind in the country that brings together scholarship, education, engaged programming about women, gender, human rights, social change, and participation. And I do say participation as opposed to representation, because it's really about who actually is participating. Um, we're an international public think tank. I think that's a good way to describe it. And we offer a dynamic and innovative approach that merges applied arts and cultural production with critical theory and academic research. And we address issues of human rights, as I said, social policy access, representation, equity, participation, race, class, all using the arts as a central mean, means of research, engagement, public education, and advocacy. Um, we've co-presented over 100 programs and initiatives since 2005, and we've produced over 12 original works in film, documentary, theater, photography, research, and publications. And the other really important project of ours is the fellowship program. We've supported over 32 artists, scholars, and thinkers, one of which, uh, who Lindsay is, and, um, and that was to really support original risk-taking and experimental and innovative work that would have a social impact. Um, the fellowship program provides a unique and unparalleled support. It, it combines financial support, customized research, resources, also helping with vision and collaboration, workshop development, and it works across disciplines. Recipients are artists, journalists, scholars, and activists who work in a wide range of disciplines, and they really include all the arts and media that you can think about. Um, a defining principle of this program is its valuable support for the creative process, which, um, much like policy and advocacy, is not a linear process. And one may start out in one place and actually end up in another place. And it's the kind of support that usually artists and creative thinkers don't get. Um, because people are very interested in what the product and what the result will be. And sometimes the product and result is really affected, or really most times, by the process the one embarks in. So some of the recent fellows um, are Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Lynn Nottage, who as part of her fellowship developed the play Ruined, um, which is a play set in present day DRC. Um, also, the filmmaker and Guggenheim fellow, Sylvia Malagrino, who created a film, Burnt Oranges, um, which is a poetic feature-length documentary narrative about the personal and social experiences in Argentina in the 1970s during the state terrorism. And then Tanya Siracha, who's a playwright who's adapting Chekhov's Cherry Orchard that will address issues of identity, immigration, and gender. And all of the fellows are really far-reaching in their artistic pro um, projects. And they really want to shift and create discourse around gender and media that maybe has not been done before. Um, the work 
that I do um, is inspired by conviction that art creates beauty, invites discovery, stimulates reflection, generates self-knowledge, and promotes debate and challenges and shifts paradigms. At the center of civil society is arts and culture. It can convey and foster a sense of personal involvement, civic consciousness, and responsibility. And at the core of my work and that of the Institute's mission is a belief that art has the ability to make good on the democratic process by supporting equitable participation that really represents the breadth of our society. And so it really is a very unusual tool um, because at its core is about participation and kind of democratic participation. <laughs> So engagement in the arts promotes a deeper understanding of human experience among and between diverse communities and individuals. And art does not necessarily seek to build consensus. And that's a really important um, part of the work that I do and also the work that you'll see of Lindsay's, is that it's not about everybody coming to the same conclusion um, and really building consensus that we can all agree on and then move from there. So some days, you know, some really great days, art can be raw and oppositional, controversial. It can be motivating, aesthetically breathtaking. And it doesn't mean that, you, that the aesthetic considerations are drained in place of social good or social goals. But really, artistic excellence is the first criteria. And I think that's an important thing um, in our work, is that we start with artistic excellence, and then we move from there. I believe that creative work is inherently about a conversation, small and discreet or large and far-reaching, far public or more private. And creating art is a political act in and of itself because it creates these kinds of conversations. They are difficult, they are challenging, they are poignant, and they are purposeful. And art is inherently political because it has the power to really engage in social justice because it raises new ideas, expands knowledge, investigates feelings, promotes our own agency. New models help us put ourselves in places that are not familiar, <clears throat> help us take risks and create new opportunities of association. Art can have consequences. So it's not just about enriching one's life, but enriching one's life because it actually has an impact and an effect. And you end up somewhere different than you started because of your engagement. So this is really what motivates us as human beings, collectively and individually. This is how we evolve and how we advocate for deep and diverse experiences and expressions. Art helps us investigate our solitudes and our interdependencies. And I think that's an important thing, is that it's not always about a communal experience, but sometimes it's about a very personal experience and how that actually affects an individual. The majority of people, when they hear about art impacting the conversation about peace and conflict or affecting human rights, think about art as a force for bridging the divide. They think about it promoting understanding and compassion. And this is valuable work and really provides rich human experiences. However, the thing that I am trying to do is use art and artistic forms of expression to add to the accepted canon of understanding of the realities of conflict. Exactly what is lost when there is no peace? And who is affected? And what is the damage seen and unseen? I add to this canon by developing work that has the space and artistic freedom to communicate complex ideas about notions of peace and war and about individual conflicts. Instead of a single image, I facilitate an entire initiative of images, voices, performances, and essays to think about, for example, the cost of the war in the DRC. This kind of artistic gesture can be compelling because it inspires people and provides a nuanced understanding of how peace is created and maintained and the kind of human toll that is paid when conflict persists without end. And I think important, uh, an important point to note here is we often toss, talk about post-conflict. And when people talk about post-conflict, they're talking about traditional conflict ending. But who is it post for? You know, mostly it's not post for women. Um, when the traditional war ends, the conflict doesn't end for women, and it doesn't end for a lot of the populations. And so I think it's important when we think about um, the kind of work that I'm engaged in, it's really not about ending a war, but it's really speaking about human conflict and, um, and when actually post does or doesn't um, occur. At the Institute, I'm honored to work with excellent cultural workers to communicate these complex and often nonlinear ideas. And it's no accident that so many of the fellows are award winners, 
MacArthur Award winners, Pulitzer Prize Award winners, Guggenheim Fellows, because this is serious work. It's seeking to break new ground in understanding of world politics, and it strives to be at the forefront of the conversations about foreign policy, about human rights, justice, about war and peace, and the priorities of a civil society. So sophisticated political ideas have always been investigated and communicated through arts and culture. This isn't new. But new models of creative investigation help us put ourselves in places that are not familiar and create new opportunities of association and shifts in perspectives. And that's why it's so important, is the idea is that we want to actually shift where we feel comfortable. Um, and you, you might work to help someone enter into a creative and artistic experience, but you're helping actually push them further than they would go by themselves. So it's not about a comfort zone. It's actually about creating spaces that push people beyond um, where they might be able to imagine or what they currently understand. In order to be successful, the worst must come from a very complex understanding of political realities on the ground, and it must reach the highest achievements of artistic expression with precision and focus. And that kind of work only comes from authentic and talented people. Finally, the work must be seen, engaged, experienced. So I strategically make connections, find outlets, and where none exist, I create those places and spaces. I work to create structures, context, audiences, and relationships. So I'm just going to give a couple examples of historically um, how arts and social change have affected some of world events and struggles and revolutions that I think we're all familiar with. And South, A that South African anti-apartheid struggle is one. Many in the movement have spoken about the power of the poetry and the str of, in the struggle coming from India and South and Central America, such as Pablo Neruda. Neruda said that he would write relentlessly of the blood in his country's streets and not of natural wonders until there was no more blood th flowing through his city. And we're also aware of the power of generations of music from South Africa that had an immense effect on the world's understanding of apartheid, its depth of social wrong and violent human toll. It also really communicated what the global responsibility might be. I was honored to serve on the Artworks and Architecture Program Committee of South Africa's Constitutional Court. I was asked by uh, Justice Albie Sachs to participate. And the courthouse was the first major public building project in post-apartheid South Africa. The artwork was commissioned, collected, and installed representing the whole of South Africa from every corner of the country. And the work needed to be of the highest aesthetic quality that represented the spirit of human dignity in all its varied manifestations. It really needed to express the new identity of a new country and also its new justice system. The work makes explicit the connection between arts and human rights through the pieces chosen and the challenges of the beautiful and often difficult content. It shows how art and human rights overlap and reinforce each other. At the core of human rights and artistic behavior is respect for human dignity. It is this that unites art and justice. It's impossible to talk about the arts and social change and security without at least mentioning the AIDS epidemic and how it affects the communities over the world. It has destroyed some and created others. And I speak very generally here. Some might say that the art that addresses the epidemic speaks to the spaces and the voids, the emptiness, the absence, the possibility, and the loss of that possibility. In places where medical support is available, many artists have chosen to address the idea of living with HIV and AIDS and the social effects on a community. However, it cannot be denied that AIDS, the AIDS epidemic creates an immeasurable void and continues to across the world in many different ways. The most widely documented um, space of AIDS historically in the United States would be the AIDS quilt that was um, really unfolded in the 1980s across acres of memory and loss that kept growing and inhabiting such authority-filled places as Capitol Hill here in Washington, D.C., became a poignant equivalent of what was lost at that time. And it located itself within a long tradition of populations creating community and space within and through the constraints put on them through power structures. Um, it was one of the first times that a piece like that was really taken over and really re developed a kind of public space. More recently, as the U.S. prepared to invade Iraq, um, artist Adele Lutz conceived a public intervention to promote awareness about the direct effects of war on women and children, issues of peace and security, or the lack of both. 
Artists took a slow journey through New York City, wearing black burqa silkscreen with statistics about war, interrupting the stride of thousands and thousands of passerbys, causing them to pause and consider war's repercussions. There's a fantastic video of really slowing down the streets of New York City, and I'm sure you all know how there's a kind of velocity in New York, um, and to really slow that up um, could only take the Iraq War and uh, a kind of creative gesture like this. There are examples like Pentaluma, an African-based hip-hop group that's creating music in non-colonial languages to bring attention to the loss of history and generational knowledge while addressing current social issues like education, land, water, housing, health care, human rights, and the struggle for social justice. They create music that really is in the philosophy of uh, one of Martin Luther King's poignant statements, that peace is not merely the absence of violence, but the presence of justice. And for me, again, that brings back that idea of, of post-conflict. Um, there is no post-conflict if there's no presence of justice. And always visibility is part of social justice. If things are not seen and not heard, there is no justice there. There's a Pakistani artist, Rashid Rana, who creates traditional Persian rugs designed that cover a 10-foot wall. And they, um, they are just a, a beautiful layered um, replica of um, old Persian designs of, of tapestries. At closer examination, the viewer realizes that the detailed design is made up of images of current violent events and human slaughter. It is the age-old experience of beauty and destruction seamlessly coexisting, and I think we've all seen that. However, in this instance, the events are immediate and moments old, the horror fresh with wet blood, and some of the pieces are actually wet. So that you really see these are not kind of historical references or um, documentation, but they are happening right now, yesterday, and unfortunately tomorrow too. Um, another project is off the beaten path, which we are actually opening in, the, um, in Chicago next week, and it's an international multimedia art exhibit focused on violence and women and art. Um, it includes 30 artists who are addressing violence against women and girls through artwork, and it includes artists like Yoko Ono, Hank Willis Thomas, Louise Bourgeois, and Susan Plum, and many others. Um, it focuses on the principles of the exhibit of violence in the individual, family, community, culture, and politics. And a new international project that I'm involved in um, creating is a global radio series entitled Gender, Human Rights, Media, and Leadership. Um, in partnership with National Public Radio and Public Radio International. Um, the first installment aired in November with an Institute Fellows work, Natalie Moore, and reports from Libya and women's movement and the youth movement there. And it'll continue with reports by Institute Fellow Jean Friedman from Paz Bolivia about the union organizing of incarcerated mothers and the women's movement in Juarez, Mexico, related to the extreme violence. Um, we'll continue across the African continent, including projects in Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria, Mozambique, and South Africa, as well as from Iraq, Afghanistan, India, and elsewhere. And a final example is E. Patrick Johnson, who is also an Institute Fellow. Um, I worked with the artist for over three years to develop and produce a play he wrote and performed entitled Sweet Tea, Gay Black Men of the South, which is based on an oral history of men from the ages 21 to 97 and their life experiences and their sexual and gender identities, families, relationships, race, class, religion, HIV and AIDS. Here's an example of the cultural production of work that supports an individual's own agency and power and helps make visible a population and experiences that have historically been absent, invisible and often erased. Often the creation of socially impactful work shifts what is considered the mainstream canon by actually adding to the historical record. And this is an ex a perfect example of that. This is an oral history that has never existed. Um, Sweet Tea actually will open in Washington, D.C. in September. Um, we've developed the traveling um, um, series of performances across the United States, so you all get a chance to see it. I want to reinforce that going public isn't always easy. It's really a risk. These conversations are not necessarily easy ones. And because they can really affect change, um, they are not often met with, you know, welcoming arms. 
Soon um, you'll hear from a remarkable cultural worker and humanitarian, Lindsay Adario, who has an important and layered perspective. I believe artists and journalists who engage in this kind of work ask themselves very courageous questions and complicated questions, each one of them willing to mine for the form and gesture that is most authentic. Each original creative voice has an opportunity to be a catalyst. And um, in relationship to other voices, it's a very powerful thing. Um, Lindsay, whether it's in her work with major international publications, as you might have seen, or our recent project, The Congo Women, Portraits of War, which is an internationally traveling exhibit and educational initiative. And Lindsay will show us some of the work she did as a commission for that exhibit, and she'll also be showing us much more. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I developed that program and then um, hand it over to Lindsay. Um, but for many years I was really obsessed with what was happening in the DRC and I couldn't believe the extent of the violence and the extreme circumstances. I also couldn't believe the kind of silence um, and the lack of response that was happening across the world. So because my work is in the arts, I started to think about what to create to be part of a dialogue, believing that art has the ability to affect that kind of change. Um, I partnered with Artworks Projects and we developed the Congo Women Exhibition. We commissioned Lindsay as an Institute Fellow to travel the DRC and take the time to create portraits of women who are survivors of gender-based violence. With her compassion, skill, and aesthetic instincts, the exhibit is comprised of photographs saturated with human dignity and the raw, beautiful, and challenging life force of the women in the photographs. We, again, we are honored to have incredible support from UNFPA, um, and especially Sarah Craven and Thurai Obadi and uh, Sophia Cigar and um, Christian Del Sol. We wanted the photographs to be huge and overwhelming, but human and personal. We wanted them saturated and composed. We wanted the exhibit to, to enter each person through all of their senses, to see, hear, and feel the women. We thought perhaps when we finally finished the exhibit, um, that the conflict would be over. Of course, that isn't the case. Um, so in light of that, um, I'm glad to say that the Congo Women Exhibit seems to have become a tool that many local, national, and international organizations are using to create awareness and influence policy. It's already traveled to 20 locations, Yale University, United Nations headquarters in New York and Geneva, the London School of Economics, the House of Parliament, the Senate building here in D.C., and it's scheduled to travel to over 20 more venues internationally and nationally. In May 2009, Senator Boxer and Feingold invited us to install the exhibit at the Senate building and serve as a visual component to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearings on confronting rape and other forms of violence against women in conflict zones. And then we asked Lynn Nottage to speak um, and the central a um, actor from the play Ruined at the reception. So she delivered a monologue from Ruined. And along with the testimonials from policymakers and more traditional experts, the public officials experienced the effects of violence in the DRC through a powerful art form, and that made a, a huge difference. We also opened it at the United Nations, hosted by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and over 800 guests arrived. I think one of the things that <coughs> is important is that um, people often ask why we use the arts um, to really address these kinds of issues. And arts have historically been used at the center of social change, so that's not something that we've actually come up with. But the exhibit that we've tried to create insists that the viewer experiences what peace and the lack of it actually feels like. I think we're all painfully aware that this is a human-made humanitarian disaster and it's not a natural disaster and so it's ours and how do we actually own that? How do we allow um, that experience to actually translate into action? I think that we can all agree that diplomatic efforts and international relations are improved when the public is informed and sympathetic to the complexities of foreign relations in a nuanced way. It makes policy efforts much more effective. The arts can actually assist in those efforts. And that's one of the things that we hope um, that, that the um, Congo Women exhibition helps do. 
what is happening across Africa has a great impact on the rest of the world, and it also provides models for understanding in other situations. And so the idea is not just so that everyone becomes an expert on the DRC, but that these kinds of issues can be applied and can be seen in other places, and the tools that we develop can actually be used in other situations. So without further delay, I would like to introduce my wonderful friend, Lindsay Adario. Um, her work adds oxygen and audiences to lives and human experiences that we might not have seen or known about. And she brings her skill as a photographer and her deep compassion and focused desire to all the work that she does. Um, I, I can't express my uh, deep admiration or love for her, and I know that um, it's a real treat for all of you to hear her today. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for coming. Thank you for everyone for hosting us and for supporting our work. I'm going to start out um, just for a little background. I've been photographing for 15 years. Uh, I've been based in Argentina, Mexico for two years, India twice. I'm actually living in India now, uh, Istanbul for seven years, and I covered the Iraq War 2003-2004, so it was basically living in Baghdad. <laughs> I've covered uh, Afghanistan for 10 years. I've been going, uh, I started going initially when it was under Taliban rule and made three visits there under the Taliban. Uh, just saved my money and went because I was interested to see the condition of women living under the Taliban. And covered the fall of the Taliban and then Iraq. Darfur I've been covering for six years. Um, and Lebanon, I covered the Lebanon-Israel war. I try to, uh, what I try to do in my work is give the people a voice and give and to show situations in the people's voice. So recently I've been adding sound to still photos and I've been, I just recently started doing some videos and I'll show one of them today. Um, Jane and I collaborated on Congo. I had been going to Congo and please excuse my technical <laughs> non-skills. Um, I started going to Congo in 2006, and initially I was going for the New York Times and traveling there with Lydia Polgreen. And I just wanted to provide a little context for, this, for the images that I'll show you uh, on rape in Congo, which I did with Jane um, with UNFPA. These are some images. Uh, in 2006, 7, and 8, I went several times and was photographing the, the displaced, the refugee camps, uh, the violence, went and met with rebel leader Nakunda, and tried to photograph women rape victims, but it's such a sensitive subject that it's really something that you need time to do. And I would not have been able to do that at all had it not been for the grant that Jane uh, gave me. And with that, I was able to go and spend two weeks on the ground interviewing women and getting in their own words what was happening and what it, getting their stories. What happened? Where were they when they were abused? This is a... I can't stop this. Does anyone want to slow I don't know how to slow this down, so I'm just going to let it run through. It's not connected. Spacebar stopped it? Okay, great. Thanks. So um, we'll start here. This is a young girl who was raped, and we were very careful. There were, there were two approaches to this. We were doing a community project, and some of the photographers felt that they, it wasn't correct to show faces. For me, when I photograph, I always leave this issue up to the subject because I don't feel it's fair for anyone to go in and to make that decision for someone else. I understand that there is a degree of ignorance in some of these cultures. They don't understand the media. They don't understand how their image will be shown to millions of people. But I think that there are ways of conveying this. And I also think that there are many people who want to tell their stories and think it's very important to tell their stories so it won't happen to other women. So we had, so when I went in there, I knew that the final product was not going to show full faces, but for me it was very important as a documentary photographer to, to, to show their faces of the women who really expressed that they wanted their stories told. And so I did a combination of sound and, um, and still images. 
and this woman was held as a as a sex slave for two years and she gave birth to these children actually seven years sorry and she gave birth to these two children while she was held in a camp this woman was also held for a year and each woman has a story behind them. I don't have the sound here with me, but each, so when we did the exhibit, what we did is we, uh, Jane, you can talk about what you did, but Jane had the transcripts that I had taped, and she made a decision to basically put the sound with, with the still images that were projected. I mean, women who are getting raped in Congo range from two years old to this woman was 70 years old. This woman had HIV after she was raped. This woman as well. This woman was talking about how she had had elephantitis and when the rebels came she couldn't run away and so she was raped. I want to go into the next. Okay, I'm going to show you a video now of um, this year, Women Deliver gave me a grant to go photograph in collaboration with UNFPA uh, maternal mortality in Sierra Leone. And when I went there, I had the support, the logistical support on the ground of UNFPA, which was incredibly helpful because basically I went in for a very short time and I knew that I wanted to photograph the situation on the ground, but often you need someone, local fixers and local people who know the situation and know where to go. And so I went in, and this, I'll just play this video for you. Uh oh. Does anyone know where the. Not working. Hang on a minute. Sorry. I'll do the next part of the presentation. Okay. Can we dim the lights up here? Is that possible at all? It is or possible. no? <laughs> Just because so the screen's not so. So, in the December issue of National Geographic, I have a story on women in Afghanistan. And I started working on, I, I've been working in Afghanistan and photographing women for 10 years, but this story, this particular story I started in at the end of 2009. What I envisioned when I did this story is I wanted to show a balanced picture of women in Afghanistan. I think we've seen dramatic images. We saw, everyone saw the cover of Time magazine, the woman who had her nose cut off. Um, we've all heard stories about women, but for me, I wanted to try and give the reader a sense of what women's lives are really like. And so I didn't want it to be too positive or too negative, but I did want to show the reality. So these are some images that are from that particular spread. This is at a rally for uh, a presidential rally for Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah. This is a wedding for uh, a young Afghan couple in Kabul. The man in the white suit is the son of a very famous movie director in Kabul, and this is his bride. This particular scene, I was uh, c covering maternal health issues in Badakhshan. Badakhshan has the second r highest rate of maternal mortality in the world. And as I was driving along the street, I saw two women without a man. And in Afghanistan, that's a scene you don't often see. Generally, all women are accompanied by a man. And so I stopped the car, and my translator and I ran up. And it turned out that the woman who is in the center, she had just gone into labor and her water had broken and they were on the way to the hospital and their car broke down. So I drove them to the hospital and we had to go find the husband to get his permission to take the wife and we drove the whole family to the hospital. Um, maternal health issues are huge in Afghanistan because most most of a woman's life in Afghanistan revolves around getting married and giving birth. An Afghan woman will be pregnant up to 15 times in her life. Uh, she often loses several children either in childbirth or after they're born to disease. This, uh, I was photographing these issues at a hospital and a woman had, um, had a stillborn child and I, I asked the family if I can go home with them and I followed the burial. 
This is Fariba. She's 11 years old, and she set herself on fire. Self-immolation is something that's very prevalent in Afghanistan. A lot of women don't feel like they have an escape from abusive families. Uh, it's more often than not women who are married, and they are abused by their, their husbands. Uh, Fariba had seen this, had heard about other women who were older than her, and... Um, yeah. So. You want me to play? Excuse me. While we're sorting that out, I've just been told we can't turn the lights down because of the webcast. Okay. <laughs> so we'll have All to right. deal with that. <laughs> no, no, no. Huh. I think that's more important. <laughs> Strange, it was working before. It is. Oh, maybe not. The woman in the middle was Mama Cisse. And she. Thank you. My name <coughs> I'll just continue with Afghanistan and then go back. So Fariba, um, when I interviewed Fariba, she said that the reason why she burned herself is because someone came to her in the middle of the night and told her to set herself on fire. Obviously, that doesn't seem very credible for an 11-year-old girl. So in speaking with some of the health workers, one of the NGOs working with her, he said that she had been abused by her parents. Um, this is something for an 11-year-old girl. It's unfathomable. This young woman had been accused of stealing by a neighbor, and she was so she was so shamed and and felt horrible for shaming her family into thinking that she had stolen that she she doused herself in petrol and set herself on fire. These women come to the hospitals in Herat and Kabul. There are two main burn wards in Afghanistan. They come to the hospitals, and often there are no resources. the The hospital in Herat is very well funded. It has a humanitaria. Uh, which is a French NGO working there, and they've they've really redone the burn ward. But the hospital in Kabul is is abysmal. There's nothing. They have no medication. Most of the women can't pay for the medication they need, and they die of infection. They can't pay for their own food. Um, it's it's really incredible that ten years after the fall of the Taliban, they still have they still don't have bandages for these women. This is in the women's prison in Mazar Sharif. Uh, Maida Hall, she was married off when she was eight years old to a paraplegic who was about 70. And she had to take care of him every single day. And her brothers used to beat her. And this is her reacting. A lot of women in Afghanistan are in prisons without any possibility of release because they have no one fighting their case. If they do have people fighting their cases, there's no, there, there is no justice in Afghanistan. Most of the time it's bribes that get people out. And even if a woman is released, once she's been in prison, she's so, it's such a shame on her family that she'll be killed when she gets out. So this is Maida Hall reacting to another woman has been, who has been released from prison. Uh, there are Afghan women joining the police forces in Kabul and across the country, and this is one of the sh training sessions at the firing range. I wanted to show uh, Afghan women in a traditionally male situation, and I thought it was great seeing these women out. Um, a lot of these women are widows, uh, widows who are the breadwinners for their families. They don't have husbands saying to them, we don't want you to, to work this job because their husbands have died, and many of their husbands were police themselves. This is Bibi Aisha, the same woman that was on the cover of Time magazine. Um, this is about two days after she arrived at the shelter in Kabul, so about three weeks after she had had her nose cut off. Uh, the portrait that was taken in time was shot about seven months after this, just so you have some sort of time frame of why she looks different. Um, Bibi Aisha was uh, traded. Uh, there's, a, there's a tradition in Afghanistan where a woman is traded to a family to settle a debt. Uh, for example, if two families fight and one family feels they've been wronged, then one uh, a family will offer his daughter as compensation. So she was traded when she was eight years old, and she lived in the barn until she got her first period and then was married to one of the, the men of the family, who was a Talib. And he beat her repeatedly, and finally she tried to run away because she was hurt so badly, and that's when he cut he, she was sent to prison, and then she, when she came back, she had her nose cut off. Sorry, these are a bit out of order. <laughs> back to the police force. 
Uh, there are American women Marines now operating in Helmand Province. They're part of the female engagement teams that the U.S. military has put out. Um, they're trying to sort of to engage women, f- which comprise 50% of the population in Afghanistan, and they're really trying to get information out of Afghan women. Anyone who's been to Afghanistan knows that Afghan women aren't privy to much of the the sort of intelligence information, but it does help sort of soften the appearance of the military. But this picture to me just really reveals the disconnect between the two cultures. And this is a vaccination at a local clinic in Helmand. These are widows in Herat outside of a mosque. On Fridays they collect handouts. This is a graduation ceremony. Women are able to to go to school now since the fall of the Taliban. There are schools throughout the country, and one of the great things you'll see are women going to university now and graduation. This is Trina. She's an actress in Afghanistan, and uh, she's divorced. She was married for 10 years. Again, she was beaten by her husband and had three sons with him and finally decided she was going to leave her husband, and she lost her three sons. She has not seen them since. And she's now an actress and d- d- does whatever she wants in Afghanistan. She drives around. She walks around without hijab. She's, she acts, which in Afghanistan is something that's seen as, a bit, as very liberal. Um, but she's a wonderful woman and, and a great character. This is a TV show being filmed in Kabul. Again, there are female producers now. There are female television celebrities, which is really great. <coughs> And this is in a beauty salon in Kabul, two young girls getting ready for a wedding. These are young university girls. They've climbed up. They're hiking in Lake Karga, which is right outside of Afghanistan. And this is at a shrine in Herat. Women are, are allowed to go to the shrine every Tuesday in Herat, and they cordon off a section for the women so the men don't, can't see them. Okay, go to the video. Okay. Here's a video from Sierra Leone. My name is Lindsay Adario. I'm a freelance photographer based in New Delhi, India. I traveled to Sierra Leone to cover maternal health issues. Sierra Leone has one of the highest rates of maternal mortality in the world. One in every eight women in Sierra Leone will face a lifetime risk of dying in childbirth. The figures are quite difficult to measure because many women who die in childbirth don't actually make it to a hospital before they die, and so their death is not reported. When we arrived at the Magbaraka government hospital, there was a, the labor room had three women in labor. The woman in the middle was Mama Sise. And she is 18 years old. Mama was forced to get married at 14 years old. When I met her, she was delivering the second of two twins. Mama had delivered the first twin in the village with no problems, but Mama had a lot of problems delivering the second baby. She was exhausted. She had been in labor almost 24 hours. She's refusing to push, even if there is contraction. When she finally delivered the baby, was completely unresponsive, and the the nurses were incredible. They, for 45 minutes to an hour, the nurse just methodically and rhythmically brought this baby to life. These are hospitals where there's not more than one doctor to go around. What is this? What's all the blood from? The placenta? In my head, I I was aware that she was bleeding a lot. The nurses weren't really nervous. You know, I didn't know what to think. At one point, I left. When I came back, it looked like her condition had gotten much worse. She was almost totally unresponsive. Someone took Mama Cisse's blood pressure, and it was down to 60-40. They finally picked her up and carried her to the stretcher. I was walking with Amanata, the sister, and Amanata started weeping, and I think it dawned on her that her sister was in grave, grave condition.
The doctor uh, did a checkup on her and took her blood pressure, and at that point, she was dead. We took the body back to the village that night, and when we arrived, it was pitch black, and all you could hear were screams of the villagers and weeping. The next morning, as light came up, female relatives continued to stand over her and mourn and weep. <laughs> Mama is one of thousands of women who die in childbirth. At the end of the day, there's just a real shortage of trained professionals, and there's a, a shortage of transportation. There's little to no road network for these people. If you're about to deliver a baby and you're, you're in labor, can you walk 10 miles to a government hospital? If you're married at 14 years old and your body isn't developed yet, how will you deliver a baby when you're still a girl? When you watch someone who in most other developed nations would survive without question, it's, it's just not fair. Okay. How am I doing on time? You're fine. Okay. So I'll run through a few more images from Darfur. Um, I've been working in Darfur since 2004. I first, uh, most of my coverage has been for the New York Times and the New York Times Magazine. Uh, these initial images are from 2004 when we crossed in with the rebels and traveled around. Uh, this image was shot in 2007. Uh, there had just been an attack on a village, actually 2008, sorry. There had just been an attack in a village and the, the UN was going up in a helicopter. And I remember there was no space for journalists, there was no space for a photographer, and it was myself and a New York Times correspondent. And they said that there were, there were eight staff on the plane, on the helicopter, and the New York Times correspondent, Lydia Polgreen, started screaming and saying, do you know what impact this image will have on the cover of the New York Times? You take one of your staffers off, and they put me in, and this picture ran five columns on the front of the New York Times, and it had a huge impact. So this is on the ground. These are all displaced. Their villages had just been burned. They were waiting for food and for handouts. This is when they went back to the village and they were trying to rebuild their homes. This is from 2005, a village shortly after it had been set on fire. We were with the UN peacekeepers and uh, at that point they were, they were pretty under, underfunded and they didn't really have good weapons and they were terrified and I remember we had heard of this attack in Tama and it was a, an attack that had gone on for three days and I was with Elizabeth Rubin who is a correspondent for she's freelance but works generally for the New York Times magazine and we were very eager to get to the village because we wanted to verify the amount of people who had been killed and and the peacekeepers we were with were too scared. Every time we would go towards the village, the Janjui would shoot at us, and so they'd turn the cars around and go. So finally, we said, you're peacekeepers, you have to go in. So we went and we spoke to their commanders, and we said, look, just give us your guns. We're gonna go in ourselves if you don't. <laughs> so finally we went, we com the commander ordered them to go in. And as we're driving towards the village, the Janjui would set it on fire right in front of us. And we just, sort of, we just kept driving. And when we got there, they had left. This woman we found on the side of the road as we were driving, they had, they had tried to flee and had collapsed on the way. 
Darfur is a very difficult place to cover. The Sudanese government makes it very difficult to get access and to get permits. So it takes, sometimes you have to wait a month sitting in Khartoum to get a permit to Darfur. And even when you do get in Darfur, you need a permit to move anywhere. So they'll give you a permit to one of the three capitals, but you have to fight every minute of every day to get a photograph and to get access to anything. I've been detained there numerous times. Even with all my permits intact, they still detain you. So these are all images of after attacks and burials. They're, they range from 2004 to 2009. This woman was a rape victim and she had been beaten by Janjui when they came into the village. Each person has a different story. This is a rebel conference. Many child soldiers. This is in 2004, the kid on the left. He said he was 18. <laughs> Funny. <coughs> I think the, the international community had a lot of, there, there was a lot of attention that was paid to Darfur and many people didn't have experience on the ground. So you, there were many activists in the States or wherever just talking about the genocide, the genocide, the genocide. But in my opinion, Darfur really evolved into a, a tribal conflict. In the beginning, yes, maybe it was a genocide, but I think at some point the rebels really started provoking as well and they really started raping and attacking in their own right and it, it evolved into a different sort of conflict that wasn't really recognized by the international community and I think that's what sort of compelled me to keep going. In 2009 I went to the tribal areas of Pakistan with Dexter Filkins for the New York Times Magazine. Uh, we wanted to talk to the Taliban in Pakistan and we, Dexter spelt, spent about five five weeks setting it up and called me up and said, I think we're going to get access. And of course, the one thing they said is don't bring a woman. Do not bring a woman to meet the Taliban. And so Dexter said, we have to, we have to. I said, well, I'm not staying in the hotel. So our translator was tormented and said, what are we going to do with you? How are we going to bring a woman into the tribal areas? And, and he said, I know, you can be Dexter's wife. And I said, okay. So we get all dressed up, and I'm wrapped up like a cigar. You can't see a single ounce of my skin. And so, so the translator says, when, you, when we drive into the tribal areas, just stay in the car. So I said, okay. And we had to pass through another commander's area, so we were sure we would get kidnapped or killed on the way. So when we finally made it to Haji Namdar's area, everyone jumps out of the car, and it was raining. Everyone jumps out of the car, and I'm sitting in the car. They go inside, and they ask permission for Dexter's wife to come in. So I go inside, and... It's a room of 30 Taliban fighters, and they're all armed to the teeth, and the commander is sitting in the middle. And I have my full veil. I'm trying to see through my veil as I walk. And Dexter sits down and says, Haji Namdar, this is my wife. And could she take some pictures? <laughs> <laughs> it was very funny. So by the end, they loved us, the husband and wife team. And they took us all around, and they were laughing at us. They said... They said, you Americans, we use your tax dollars. And we were literally, I'm sitting there and they're laughing at us. The whole time they just laughed at us. They said, they said, you know, you Americans, you give money to the Pakistani government and they give it to us. Ha ha ha. And we're just sitting there. It was incredible. And so we spent the day with them. This picture says, God is watching you. And Pakistan has gotten cons more and more conservative. I went there for the first time in 2000, and there's no comparison to what, it, what it's like now. Uh, this year, uh, the first living soldier has won the Medal of Honor, Honor since Vietnam, and we were with that platoon of guys. I spent two months in the Korangal Valley living in a bunker with uh, soldiers from the 173rd. This is after an attack. Uh, we were with the American troops when they dropped bombs on an area, and this child was brought into the medevac center, the medical center, the next day. 
This is after an ambush, uh, one of the ambushes in Rock Avalanche where the soldier won the Medal of Honor for, and one of the soldiers had just been killed, so they're carrying the body bag through the mountains. These images are very difficult to get because uh, there's a lot of censorship on the ground. The soldiers are generally wonderful, but when someone is wounded, uh, it's very hard. Adrenaline is running, people are very upset, and it's, you, you really need to spend a long time with the soldiers for them to enable you to photograph wounded. But I think because we were living with them for two months, it, it really... This is uh, signaling a location to drop a bomb for an AC-130. This is what you call sparkling, and you can only see it through night vision goggles. So they mark a target, the JTAC on the ground will mark a target, and then the AC-130 will come in and bomb that area. This is the Americans trying to explain to the Afghans why they have bombed their villages. <laughs> <laughs> And in December of last year, I was with a soldier when he stepped on an IED and he died in the medical center. And this is a prayer after his death. That's it. <clears throat> Well, it's hard to think of any words to follow that. Uh, immensely moving and, and revealing uh, images for us all. And uh, there's, there's so much richness in, in both of your presentations. Uh, uh, and, and probably, I, I mean, I could keep us talking all day just on the, the role of uh, liberation art and music and uh, literature in South Africa uh, during the 70s and the early 80s. Uh, but let's open it up to the floor. Um, we have microphones. Uh, raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Microphone will arrive magically, and you will get to introduce yourself and uh, make your comment and question. Uh, okay, there we go. I see one hand here. <clears throat> and, and we can sort of bundle uh, two or three comments together. Hi, my name is Diana. I'm the music and arts protege at National <clears throat> Community Church. This question is for Lindsay. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing and doing everything that you did. Um, I have a lot of artists in the church that actually go on a lot of missions trips. What motivates you to be bold and what keeps you going? What keeps your drive? Um, what makes you go back to another trip, you know? Like, um, I think it's hard for my artists to do that. Sure, because it's not fun a lot of the time. <laughs> I mean, I would say I spend about 250 to 300 nights a year in some weird tent or hotel room in the middle of nowhere. And I think for me it's about uh, showing the greater American public what's happening. Um, I think I'm honored and privileged to have access to the people that I have access to, and I've been really lucky to, to have people share their lives with me and share very, very intimate moments. And for me, it's, it's, there, there are few women who work in conflict zones, um, and I think that we have a different... Um, access to women and I think it's important to keep doing that and to show people and to ideally for me what it what sort of keeps me going is that I I hope that people will help them and and will do something to you know for the burn story the self-immolation story there was a video that um, I was going to show but we couldn't get it going but for me my my one of my main goals of doing that story was to try and get funding for the hospital in Kabul because I just, all the years I've been going there, I just can't believe they still don't have bandages. I mean, it's astonishing to me, you know, the millions and billions of dollars that go to Afghanistan, you know, the fact that these women die for, you know, they can, they can survive. So there are many reasons that sort of inspire me to do what I do, but most of them is to just simply educate people who don't have access to places that I have access to and to cover wars that we are involved in as Americans. And I think, you know, it's a very unique time in history right now, you know, we, between Iraq and Afghanistan. I think it's very important to document what's going on on the ground. And to me, it's, aston it's amazing that people aren't more against the wars because I, from what I see on the ground, I, it's incredible. Well, just encourage you to keep doing that because the disconnect is is grave. I've I've spent a lifetime too in 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 conflict zones and uh, and and uh, and war zones too, and and I'm just amazed at how 
how unknowing most of the American public are uh, and how, how privileged we are in the lives we live and, and how much we don't know about what happens. Mm. Remarkable imagery here. I saw a hand right over here, right there. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Nana, and I just want to say thank you to all of you, and especially to Lindsay. I'm a Sierra Union individual, and seeing that video just really touched me. And it is so, you're so right. There's so much that needs to be done, especially the fact that women are dying every day. And I understood what they were saying, and it was in Timney. And that's my dad's tribe, so that just had a greater impact. Thank you guys so much. And as a college student, more than ever now, just seeing this just makes me want to do so much more to get involved. Thank you, guys. See, it's working already. <laughs> okay, next question. Don't, don't get, keep your hands up because I'll start asking questions and I'll dominate everything. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Kim Dioria Vazir from the Department of State. Thank you both, uh, Jane, for your talk and Lindsay <coughs> for the photographs. They were incredible and inspiring. But what you both just said, you know, I work for the Department of State and pay attention to these issues, and probably most of you that are here also pay attention to these issues, so we know. But how do you, you know, how do I get my family? I mean, I can't even get my family to pay attention to this kind of stuff, much less middle America. And so you say that people aren't paying attention. So this is great, but, you know, how do you get NBC to broadcast that? Because the images that they broadcast, people don't know because the mass media doesn't support it. And so it's great for all of us, and we're, I would imagine, are all advocates, but how do you get it out to the rest of the people or to, I you can, know, to my family, for I example? I can tell you how. If we're allowed to start photographing the dead, there is not, in 10 years of war, there are maybe three or five pictures of American dead soldiers. And that, in my opinion, as a journalist who's been covering these conflicts, conflicts, I think that would make a huge difference with the American public. We are not allowed to photograph American soldiers dying. We are now the only, the only censorship that's been lifted is at Dover, and you have to get permission from the family before. You have to stand 200 meters away. There is no intimacy in those photographs. It is very difficult to photograph the dead. I think if Americans saw the amount, the sheer amount of Americans who are dying, if it were like Vietnam where it wasn't censored, where you can actually photograph what's going on on the ground, it would be a different response. I think people don't see it. Why, you know, why would they react if they can't see what's happening? But uh, just the imagery you showed, uh, for instance, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, is that uh, able to be That's fine aired because they're on, not on American. NBC? <laughs> it's fine because they're not American. Only American soldiers are mm -hmm. what's, what's impossible to photograph. Yeah, I think some of it is really creating these ways of intersecting. So... Um, you know, like with this new program with um, NPR and Public Radio International, one of the things they said to me is, we have to review every topic that will be part of the series. And I said, no, right? And so <laughs> if you want to do this project, and because I'm doing things they can't do, then they have to say yes. And so, um, so there are things like that where you actually use um, the influence and the access that you have. And I think that's, you know, when, when you were just talking that one of the things that comes with knowledge and access is a sense of responsibility, and that means that you leverage everything you have. The other thing is about having it relate to one's life, and, and it, it's not, oh, and this is your child or this is your mother, because sometimes, you know, that's not the case, right? But um, I would do these curatorial talks um, during the Congo Women Exhibition, and we had these young women's leadership um, groups come from the Chicago Public Schools. And all of the teenagers sit there and they'd say, you know, I don't even know where DRC is, and I don't really care. And so then I said, well, how many of you have a cell phone? And everyone raised their hand with their cell phone, except one young woman whose phone was broken, and she didn't have it that day. <coughs> so I said, okay, now I'm going to tell you how your cell phone is connected to what's happening in the DRC. So that sounds like a great trick. And then they were all amazed, right? And we took apart the phones. And I, of course, couldn't help them put it back together. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then the other thing that happened is they all started to talk about the kind of violence that they um, unfortunately experience in their own lives. And so within two hours, we had, um, we had them really locating themselves within it. And I think what Lindsay's saying about 
um, really being able to see what's happening. I know growing up during the Vietnam War that that was a huge everyday coming home. My parents were very politically involved, but it, you know, so that added to it, but just seeing it on television, hearing it on the radio, having it actually intersect with your life. And I think, you know, the problems with mainstream media are the problems with mainstream media, but the more we actually push it and demand that that's the kind of information that's out there, um, you know, it will make a difference. I think the, the, um, the portrait on the cover of Newsweek, but also Lindsay's, you know, that, you know, having that out there and having that actually be something that um, people would see and people would see it in this really mass way. Like, you could go to the grocery store and not even buy Newsweek. And ha I mean, time. <laughs> Sorry, time. <laughs> Scratch that. <laughs> <laughs> Single photos do have amazing impact. Remember the photo uh, in the Vietnam War of the assassination of the uh, yeah. uh, 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 Viet Cong that. by the uh, village <laughs> official or whatever it was. But I think it was on the front page of the New York Times, but just ran forever. Really, really got people's attention. I saw a hand here first. Yes. Yep. Wait. Identify yourself. <laughs> Marian Pratt, I work on disaster assistance in the Agency for International Development. I have two very different <coughs> questions, if I might, and bravo for the wonderful work echoing the comments earlier. One is related to measuring, however possible that might be, the impact of your work, how you go about doing that. Because you can say, well, this had tremendous impact, everyone was talking about it, but then the so what, what concrete things might have come out from that? Because that's so important in terms of limited funding and where to invest and the types of work that you do and what has the most effect. And then the second thing is a bit tougher if you're looking for uh, controversial types of issues. So many people come to us talking about Africa in particular and saying all we see in terms of exposure is war and injustice and fighting and hatred. And in every country, where we work, there's, as you know, because you've been there, there's so much more going on than that. Have you thought about, and maybe you already have, and I haven't seen that particular work, have you thought about a presentation that juxtaposes what life is in other parts of these countries and what could be if there weren't war in, let's say, Eastern Congo? Because there's just so much good and so many positive images that I think are underemphasized in a lot of the work that artists do. Okay. You want to go? You can start and then I'll go. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, measurements are, are, are always difficult, you know, and so what are you measuring and what are you hoping for? So, you know, one example is working with UNFPA and bringing the Congo Women Exhibition as part of the Senate hearings and the fact that everybody had to walk through that exhibition to get to um, the hearings and then also into the Senate building because it was strategically in the rotunda right, opposite security, and so you had to go through. Um, but it was, I mean, I would say just as one example, and, and Sarah can add to this, was Senator Boxer's response. I mean, she, in the hearing, said, I don't know where I've been the last 12 years, and, but I'm not going to be there anymore, right? And, and, and she has access to, you know, so much information that I don't. <coughs> um, and she talked about that kind of impact and what that meant for her. Um, she promised within a month to have a letter sent to the Secretary of State, and within two weeks, you know, she had sent it. And it really included a, a, a really strong strategy. And when we walked through the exhibition with her, and she was asking us about particular pieces um, that Lindsay had done, she had not heard the kind of details of that work, right? And she didn't really think about what that means in terms of the policy that she would be promoting. So sometimes we have that kind of, we can see that kind of direct impact. And sometimes you're creating long-term shifts, as you know, you know, in relief work, um, it, that it, sometimes shifts are enough and shifting enough so that the, the geography, geography of knowledge and perception starts to look different. Um, other times there's, you know, things that are measurable. Um, with Sweet Tea, um, the play that I was talking about, I was just in Uganda um, working with LGBT activists and we're talking about bringing this, you know, black gay history to Uganda. And as you all know, not a, not a real gay friendly um, <laughs> country. <laughs> Understood. Um, 
And so, you know, how, how will that conversation be met? When will that happen? How will that work? And so sometimes measurables in the arts are difficult, and it's often why the arts or culture gets passed over, because they say it's not, it's not hardcore sciences. But um, when you think about the kinds of things that have been at the center of revolutions and social change, the arts are right there. And they are measurable. They're just measurable in, in different ways. So sometimes we um, enjoy things that are very concrete, and other times um, you know, we don't. And then also to answer your, your um, other question or, or comment is, again, with this radio series, that it's about um, gender, human rights, and leadership. So it's not necessarily the absence of those things, but really the presence of it and looking at new models of leadership and engagement that are really you know, celebrations of human capacity um, in the midst of struggle, um, in the midst of obstacles. And so that is really important. Uh, that that actually ride alongside and on top of all of the other things. Because no place is completely one thing or another. I mean, I think in a place like Eastern Congo, it's pretty hard to focus on the positive because there is an overwhelming amount of negative. And I think it would be irresponsible journalistically to go and do something sort of happy town in the refugee camps. <laughs> I just don't think. I think that it's just... There's so much de desperation going on. That said, I think a place like Afghanistan, what I tried to do with National Geographic is do exactly that, show both the positive and negative, and show sort of an equal balance, even though in my experience for a woman in Afghanistan, it is much more negative than positive. But I did try and put a lot of positive images in the story because there are developments and there are things that are that are happening since the fall of the Taliban. But I do think that change for Afghanistan and development for women has to come from Afghans themselves. It's not going to come from the outside. And it has to come from the leaders. You know, And I said this uh, recently I was interviewed on CNN and I said, look at President Karzai's wife. She's a doctor and no one has ever seen her. She's never left the, the palace. And what kind of role model is that for women in Afghanistan? You have a woman who is a doctor and she could be out there and promoting these values to women in Afghanistan and she's invisible. You know, so the, these things have to come from Afghans, not from Americans. But as journalists, we can, we can at least show whatever side of the story we can. Uh, maybe I can offer a couple of reflections on this too, because as a person who's running a program on African uh, uh, issues, uh, obviously we're forever caught in that dichotomy that you uh, underlined there of, of good news versus bad news. Um, and so we spend a lot of time trying to engage and inform and, 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 and raise the profile of Africa on policymakers' agendas and on, on, with the general public. And, and a, a big part of that is presenting the good news stories, the, the Malis and the Benins and the, and the Ghanas and the Botswanas and et cetera, and, and, and things like uh, new uh, generation-free, age generation-free efforts by President Mokhai, former President Mokhai from Botswana, and, and et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, I never feel uh, conflicted in any way uh, by the kind of work that someone like Lindsay is doing because uh, obviously all of the good things can be swallowed so easily in the conflicts and if we're not focused on those and, and engaged in those as well, uh, you, you we're missing a bit. I think particularly of, of the work we've done in Burundi where we've made some great headway there and even though it's still a fragile situation, um, uh, it, it, we're very proud of some of the advances we've made uh, and, and the, the peace that seems to be holding there. But it can be overwhelmed in an instant by the Eastern DRC if, if that, that blows again on us. And so it's always walking that edge, one side or the other. Um, and, and on the uh, sort of monitoring and evaluation, uh, something that's demanded of us by all funders <laughs> and, uh, and something we always deal with. And any time you're dealing with, uh, uh, with such ephemeral things as, as changing the attitudes of people and the way they think about each other and, and, and you know, cultural and, and other things, it, it's, uh, it's almost always just anecdotal. You, you can't really prove anything in terms of impact for the most part. But I'll go to Burundi uh, to, to show one place where where we, where we have had a definite impact that, that is now able to be uh, 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 um, uh, 
you know, not not proven, but but at least uh, quantified in, in a certain way. And that is uh, the kind of work we do, and I'm reacting a little bit to what you said about post-conflict work and how it uh, leaves out what ac actually happens after the conflict and, and, and the un unfolding human drama of that. Uh, but the kind of post-conflict work we've been involved in is is recreating trust and relationships uh, amongst leaders and communities uh, to try to help them deal with the development, the governance, the recovery uh, uh, agendas that lie before them. Uh, because kind of the missing piece on this is always uh, we go in and we create institutions, we have elections, we get a TRC in place, we uh, we make sure the Constitution is rewritten. We, we do it all in the image of the Western world, of course. And, and, and we assume that's going to make a democracy when we're finished doing it. Uh, and yet the people who have been in conflict before are thinking exactly the same way about each other the day after the election, the day after the Constitution is written, and, and have no more propensity to work together than they did before. And, uh, and until you create some kind of sense of interdependence and, and, a, and a shared values and, and a way forward, that's not going to happen. Uh, in Burundi, we've been doing that work now for eight years with, with quite some success, but uh, we started with the uh, way before the 2005 elections and working with the military, working with the rebel groups and, and, and the various political parties. Uh, and I'll shorten this story very quickly. Uh, went through the 2005 elections successfully, worked with the integration of the Army Command and the Army uh, 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 field commanders and above uh, in terms of bringing in all the rebel groups into the Army when they were uh, demobilized and, and integrated. And, uh, and then we got to the 2010 elections and we had a whole new set of political players and things were falling out and as you probably were aware if you followed Burundi, uh, it didn't go very well. All the opposition parties withdrew from the elections after they accused the, uh, the ruling party of, of rigging them uh, when they had the first communal elections. But what did hold was the army. There, uh, heretofore, it had been the flashpoint, the Tutsi-controlled army. Uh, when, when anything got tense, they were the ones who went out and precipitated the violence and, and, and began things. There was a lot of reciprocation. It wasn't just Tutsis. It was Hutus, too. But, uh, but, but that was the flashpoint. And, and the army now, an integrated uh, a unit that, uh, that sees itself as nationally representative and, 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 and takes its, uh, its mission very seriously, held. And so there was some peripheral violence. There was uh, uh, dislocation and, and political uh, uh, falling apart in terms of in inter-party and intra-party relations. Uh, but the country didn't return to any kind of the intercommunal violence before. And, and so you do see the way people act and change and stuff. You, you, you can really quantify that to a certain extent. Okay, we had another question was right here, and the next one will be right back there. We've got about 30 minutes. Oh, well, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm Ayana Najuma with Global Woman magazine. Um, you mentioned the the result that you were looking for in terms of financial support uh, f in the medical situation. Whatever happened with that? I mean, we <clears> hear about uh, celebrities signing on uh, to DAFOR uh, to let their voices be uh, uh, heard in terms of spokespeople, spokespersons, but who's pulling out the checkbook and writing the check? And we look at NGOs around the world. What has been the impact? She's talked about measuring that's you know somewhat statistical, but for me, measuring is t is the action being taken. Could you speak on that? It depends on um, every story is different. I with the um, with the Sierra Leone story, that video has been used by several different governments. Uh, one, I think Norway used the video to try to raise government funds for women in Sierra Leone, and that was for addressing maternal health issues. And so they asked explicit permission just to raise money and of course I give it to them but the burn story um, I got several emails from readers what generally happens when I publish a story in the New York Times or time or people will look me up and then they write me and say they're individuals and say how can I donate money to these women now for me I'm not it's it's very difficult for me to direct someone if there is an NGO working on the ground and I think they're effective then I will give that NGO's uh, information but in the case of Afghanistan it's so corrupt that the last thing I want to do is say look I think you should give money to the Ministry of Health because it'll never get to the women you know so the real problem I have with the burn unit in the house in Kabul is that there's no NGO there's Italian 
uh, I think it's Cooperazione who's working there, but they have not been very helpful. And so basically no one is in that burn ward and no one that I would direct funds to. So when a reader writes me, and I got like four or five emails from readers saying I want to donate money. When a reader writes me, I'll just write back and say, look, I can't, I can't recommend someone specific at this point, but when I find an NGO that, that starts to work there, I'll write you back and I just keep those emails. But ideally the, the you know, the ideal would be to get a, a lot of funding, not just from individuals who want to give a hundred dollars here and a hundred there. Um, you know, it would be to get an an organization who is willing to go into that hospital and take you know take over the burn unit. Uh, just to follow up on that, I'm on the um, U.S. board of African Women's Development Fund, and it's the first foundation started by and for African women. They now fund in 42 countries um, on the continent. And they, um, they have just completed a $16 million endowment campaign. Um, and so they get funds from Ford and Rockefeller and Soros and also individuals, um, but they control it. And it's a, it's a foundation that's actually um, located in Ghana. And so one of the things that they can do is actually they know things that are happening in the countries and how to actually strategize with, with governments, with other NGOs, with collaborators. And, and this is actually a really wonderful and fierce model um, because they're really understanding the intersections between different countries and issues. Um, and so the, uh, last year they brought together women from across the continent for a feminist conference, which had never happened, um, you know, before. And they're also understanding, you know, how do they work with foreign aid? How do they collaborate, but also being in the leadership position? Um, and so that might be a, a, a really important organization for you to look up. They're really, they're doing fantastic work. And I'm happy to connect you if I can be helpful. Okay, next question, right in front here. Thank you. Um, it's on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Kay Chernoosh. I'm a photographer. I work on human trafficking. And I was particularly interested in uh, your comments about Darfur and um, how from when you first started shooting there, uh, that you saw the the issue kind of change, and I'm wondering because of the way our uh, our media and you know societal expectations are are fixed, how you um, are able to communicate that? How you're because we seem to want the sensational and not the nuanced. We want our victims to be um, perfect victims. <laughs> innocent victims, and that is not always the case. So how do you bring the complexity of the subject into what you're shooting? I think that's exactly it. I think people want the, the simple version. So it's easy to scream genocide, and that's it. So no one, it sort of absolves the reader from having to figure out what's actually happening on the ground there. But in a place like Darfur, there are many different tribes at work. There are different rebel groups. You know, when I first started going, there was but there was the SLA and there was GEM, that's it, you know, and now there are dozens of rebel groups and they all have different allegiances and they all are operating in different ways. And so I think when you just say genocide, it, it sort of, it takes away the responsibility to try and understand what's going on. And so for me, you know, I went 2004 every year, sometimes twice a year, until uh, right after the ICC indictment in 2009, I was there. And I did watch the, the conflict change, and it changed a lot. And, it, and to me, the only thing I can do is document what I'm seeing and put it in the New York Times. And I'm, I'm very lucky to have the New York Times uh, back me on many of these assignments and, and publish my work, because for me, it's one of the best forums to get my work out and to policymakers and to people who can affect change. So 
you know, I would go with Lydia Polgreen quite a lot, who's a great correspondent for the New York Times, and we, she's a very responsible journalist, and she would write about the nuances on the ground, but I think when you have a lot of organizations going around screaming, you know, save Darfur, this is a genocide, and this, no one pays attention to the, the, the nuances in the New York Times, because it's much easier to just scream like, you know, so I, it's hard. I mean, all we can do is just keep putting out the correct information, and you hope that people that you want to read it will read it, you know. And, and, and the nuance and complication goes beyond that, because as we think about the, the southern Sudan and, you know, the, the, the Sudan the referendum just uh, just underway now, uh, uh, Darfur is is only a very small piece of that action, where you've got a bay in South Cordovan and the Blue, Ma Blue, uh, Blue Nile, uh, and the Nuba Mountains and, 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 you know, all of these intricacies that, that very few of us even heard of or begin to understand, and each one of them has the same kind of dynamic of intertribal and, uh, and, 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 and north-south rivalries and, and et cetera within them. Uh, and, and, yeah, people just lose their attention span on this. It's, yeah. it's very, very hard to get people to understand. I just uh, want to add that the work is totally remarkable. Mm. Speaking for all of us, I am sure. <laughs> um, next question, here in front, again. Okay, coming down the side. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for your presentations. My name is Shea Gregory. I'm with Search for Common Ground. And I have a question for, um, for Lindsay, I guess. Both of you all can feel free to jump in. One, how can we have, create greater linkages between NGOs who are doing this kind of work and um, freelance journalists or freelance photographers who are capturing it? And I give you a specific example. Right now, we're working on maternal health in Sierra Leone. And here it is. I see this video, which <laughs> <laughs> despite all the reports that I've done, none of them quite capture what you, what you conveyed through this video. And also simultaneously, I read the New York Times all the time. And one of the things I find is that they tend to... Um, cover the same NGOs or get quotes from the same NGOs. Mm -hmm. So how can we create more voice, diverse voices um, in the newspapers as well um, so that there are different NGOs which have different perspectives and different approaches to what's happening around the world um, covered? Mm. Very good question. <laughs> I think when you're on the ground as a as a photographer or a journalist, there are certain NGOs in place, um, like MSF, for example. They're very known to be on the front lines, and to, their hospitals are always incredibly photogenic, and they're always, you know, covering sort of at the heart of the conflict. And so, for that reason, they get a lot of media attention, and they do, you know, they're they're difficult to work with. But if you set it up ahead of time, they they are easy to work with. But I think it comes with time. I think if you're doing great work on the ground or if you're doing programs that are photogenic or that are accessible to the public, then it, then people will want to work with you. I know with UNFPA, I collaborate a lot with UNFPA because I do women's issues a lot. And sometimes, you know, UNFPA will be the umbrella organization. They have a lot of local NGOs on the ground and they'll put me in touch with them. And it's so helpful because those are the people who are really there and doing the work on the ground and it's 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 wonderful because that's what I need I can't go into a country with five days and say oh I just want to go to this hospital where women are dying a lot you know I mean for me it's like I need I have to do my homework I have to do research I have to you know get people who speak local dialects I mean there's a lot that goes into trying to set up one of these stories. And if you have an organization that's doing that, it's much easier to just go with them. So if you have these programs in place, I mean, it's probably best to reach out to some journalists. If I can offer a thought on that, uh, I, I'd, I'd really kind of throw it back at you. It's, it's our responsibility as NGOs to, to make those links and to make the links with each other. Uh, I first went into Africa in 1970 at a time when there weren't really NGOs around. Uh, uh, you had uh, you had an official presence. You maybe had a missionary group or two, and and that was about it. Uh, I, I I deal in an Africa now where in any capital I go into, including in a place like Monrovia or or even go up in Banga in the in the northwest in Bong County, and and there's there's dozens of NGOs on the ground, and yet you find them not talking to each other very much. I've spent uh, the last eight years that I've been here at the Woodrow Wilson Center spending an awful lot of time liaison. I talk to John and Su Susan Collin Marks constantly. We 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 work together in Burundi. We work together in uh, Liberia. We're talking about Zimbabwe, but but it's really on 
on us to make those links and be sure we understand what, you have, what each other is doing and, and find out how we can use resources like uh, Lindsay. Um, and I see her as a wonderful resource for all of us. Next. Sure. <laughs> 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 Take advantage while you can. <laughs> okay, she's talked about NGOs. Um, Global Woman Magazine, one of the issues that we're taking on is FGM, female genital mutilation. I've uh, been doing a lot of research, and that is critical. And the more people I talk to about the issue, the more people say, you know, they're in denial, uh, a lot of people. Uh, Folks in this co in this country are not knowledgeable about the issue, and then African women I speak to are in denial. Oh, it's not happening there. But what I've noticed is uh, around this particular issue, which is something I want to talk to two of you about, um, is that there are organizations that are doing work and that are really making a big change in the world. For example, Tosan, who has gone into Senegal and has gotten 4,500 villages, to, and these are elders and, and, and men who are saying, you know, let's think about this issue about FGM in another way. The question I put to you is, is the images you create, the work you're doing um, in Chicago and around the rest of the world, do you find that there is a turn, a flip, of in-country work being done that people, that you're, when someone saw your picture, even if it was a U.S. Uh, or someone in Europe or around the other parts of the world that said, we want to go in and do something different, and that difference has made a difference, their impact. You mean an example of that? You know, I mean, even, you know, thinking about Tostan, I mean, one of the things that, um, that I'm really believing, and I know that in, in your work it's, it's similar, is about relationship building. <laughs> so, you know, I never, I mean, maybe someday in my life, I'll flip a switch and like, you know, <laughs> things will change. But like the work I do is, I mean, I always say if I weren't an insomniac, I wouldn't be able to do it because it's like, it's so incremental and it takes such a long time. So I don't really, I haven't had a situation where, I mean, when we started with Lindsay, we didn't have the funding to be able to do the exhibition. But she said, you know, the fighting has subsided a bit. I can actually go now. And so it's like you, you take that risk and you don't necessarily know where it's all going to go. So in the work that I do, I, I haven't, I don't know a situation where it all just all of a sudden changes. But like with Tosan, I mean, they bring elders from villages and have long conversations and little by little start to talk to each other in different ways um, and build that kind of trust. And I mean, one of the phrases in philosophy is about, you know, coming to terms. So the idea that, um, you know, I don't know if when you look at this, you see black that's the same black I see. I just know that when we look at this, we have to agree that this is black. So even if we come from different perspectives, we come from a point of attention where we then can move from. And so it's very, you know, long-term incremental work. In terms of Lindsay's work, there are individual photographs that have that kind of impact, but I would argue that it's, that it's, it's the cadence that she creates, the fact that she is so precise and focused on the work that you keep seeing that she does that actually ends up having you know, the impact. If that photograph from um, Vietnam was the only one we ever saw, mm -hmm. it, would, it would be ephemeral, you know, it would disappear. So it is this kind of consistent and long-term kind of commitment. Um, and then there is a point where things, you know, the weight of it, I mean, it's like physics at some point the weight, you know, pushes it forward. For some reason, it seems that sometimes you do have to have the shock factor. I mm. mean, when I oh, talk yeah. to people about FGM, when I start to tell them about the razor blade and they're cutting the girl's mm -hmm. clitoris off, and, and then people say, oh, no, 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 too much information. Don't, I don't want to hear it. You know, I don't want to hear it. The pictures you take are those kind of pictures that get your attention. Yeah, like the burn story. I, I'm sorry that you couldn't see the video because that's exactly, it addresses exactly that. Um, in in August, I did the story on self-immolation, separate from the photos that were in the National Geographic spread. And I spent a week in the burn unit, and it's a very graphic place. I mean, it is 
it's and, and I've seen a lot and it's it was very hard for me to witness and to and the smell and the sound and everything um and there are women screaming bloody murder all day and night and I think you know there's a limit because you don't want it to just be graphic you want to you want the reader to ask why and to uh, and you want to engage the reader and you can't engage someone if you're too gory and graphic because people will turn the page so the question is where is that line where and and how do you tell a story that is very gory and you have to capture some of that because you have to show the pain that people endure you know and you can't just make it all pretty and tame because there is pain um, but you have to have a balance so that you do maintain the attention of the reader and get them to ask questions. And and I think there's, you know, you, if every story is different, you have to find a way. But I think with FGM, it's the same. And I've seen very, uh, Stephanie Sinclair did a wonderful story on FGM. Uh, she's a she's a great photographer. And she she did very good work on that. And it was very sensitively done. And, and, and it was wonderful. I think, you know, that idea of giving people a place to enter into it um, so that they can be pushed further. And I think with FGM, I mean, one of the, the things that um, has really helped um, the kind of, you know, um, knowledge and campaign is the fact about women's health and women's health care, which has been going on for decades, and the idea of, of one having power over one's own body and what would that mean. And so there is this idea that, you know, it's come to a place where, if you do get the right tool, it will kind of open up because women are much more aware of the kind of sense of their um, power of their own bodies and what it would mean if other women don't have that and what that does mean. So I do think that there are times where, you know, there is something very dynamic and powerful. I'm not saying that, but I think it is something that builds. They say that's the reason that Tostan is so uh, successful. It's because they've been able to look at if I spend a hundred dollars giving, uh, uh, give a hundred dollars to a Zoe to cut a baby girl's clitoris, that long range amount of money I'm going to spend for depression and all the other long list of mm. negatives is not going to. Right. It doesn't weigh out. I think it's like the lady in the back said, "How do I get my sister and my cousin and my family <laughs> to want to think about this?" I mean, with FGM because it's now starting to prop you know, his ugly head in this country and, you know, Mary Bono and a couple other people on the Hill have introduced legislation that's been, that was introduced 15 years ago. Right. But now and you're now finding people coming from other countries where they're saying, oh, you all don't do that here? You know. Well, now with asylum cases, I mean, that's also had a big effect on it. I think, um, I don't know if you know the magazine New African Woman. They've just been doing a whole series on it. Um, you know, this idea of talking about things that you know, one didn't talk about before and really pushing it makes it, you know. Mm -hmm. Beg Well, you know, it, it depends. I mean, sometimes when I talk to people about that and they don't know what FGM is, and then when I say female general mutilation, mutilation is a very serious word. Uh, and then when I start to tell them about the whole issue, they're saying, oh, you're taking a baby girl and you're holding them down. And they're t how old? And, you know, people get really uh, frightened by the possibility. But now women are coming from other parts of the world. And the legislation that Mary Bono is presenting saying they say that if you take a child out of this country for the purpose of FGM, which is a lot of people from the Middle East and Africa are doing, they're taking the kids back to those countries in the summer doing break to get that done, then people start to look at themselves because they all, we all, you know, have daughters, you know, and they start to personalize it themselves, that even though it's not happening to my child, it's happening to another baby. And so, I mean, I, you know, would love some support from this room, especially the two of you who are experts in this area uh, around FGM, but I, I know you're doing phenomenal work, and it's just keep doing it because well, it's so needed. Are you. Yeah. It's really, really needed. Just a couple of comments on, on that exchange. Uh, I know in this room we we all are engaged in many of these issues, and and uh, but I think uh, I, I think you have a point about about language in, in this. Uh, we all tend to use uh, use uh, uh, acronyms, FGM, G, GBF, GBV, uh, et cetera. That that doesn't 
begin to uh, to explain and express the horror of it. And I think we can. We have to be careful about overloading the audience's senses and sensory perceptions. But but we but we we need to keep that horror in there. And, and, we, and it's when we talk about it. But also a totally different uh, kind of comment. It was building off of your uh, point on uh, sort of getting the message across, the constancy, the accumulative uh, value of it. One thing that I'm impressed by your presentation here and by the work you've done in your life is, is how it crosses regional boundaries, how, how you're talking about uh, all parts of the world. Uh, we, we so often see something about like, like what you showed on Sierra Leone, and we say, well, that's Africa. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, we kind of expect that. But but you're showing it in Afghanistan. You're showing it in uh, Latin America. You're showing it in, in Turkey. You're, you know, it, it's everywhere. And, and the more people understand that, and, and then I think it's easier to connect. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll stop at 2 o'clock because we'll, we'll, we'll run out of our session, but I don't think we have to leave the room. I'm, so you'll have I'm, plenty of time to engage people up here. I'm actually an IT person that works for the State Department. My wife brought me here today. And, um, <laughs> Yay for you. Hey, wife. <laughs> <clears throat> but I was raised by a very artistic and strong Iranian woman in Los Angeles. And my question is... And she used to, I just remember growing up, and, and unfortunately both of them are, are dead. My father is, is a very Middle Eastern man. And they, she was very strong. She would not let him tell her what to do or how to do it or when to do it or what to cook or just wouldn't have it. My question is, why don't women, I mean, why do they let men do this to them? That's the, that's the real thing it's not you know they allow it not in afghanistan <laughs> but i mean and I the can... other thing too is about the burn thing the reason why women do that is because they want to punish the men because no. it's so painful um to watch somebody suffer like that the men don't care <laughs> These men are beating them twice, three times a day anyway. So they don't care. I mean, many of these women I interviewed said that their husbands wanted to kill them anyway and said to them, I, w I hope you die, and watched them burn. Several of these women, their husbands watched them sitting on fire and didn't stop them. You know, so you, you have to understand that you're taking your – I don't. were you raised in Iran or here? Well, I was born in Iran, but I was really raised here. I, was, okay, I moved so, here when I was an infant. So, so you're taking your cultural references and identifying, you know, your knowledge as an American, and you're projecting that onto a culture like Afghanistan that is basically like the Middle Ages. And you have to understand that in one of these villages in Afghanistan, if a woman – the woman is the property of her husband. It, she, is, she is akin to a, a shirt. Okay, she is worse than a cow. She is her life <laughs> is right. worse than a donkey. She is there to reproduce. Her husband will have sex with her when he wants. She will get pregnant with no if she doesn't want to be pregnant, forget it. I mean, there's no and he will beat her when he wants. She will cook for him and clean for him and he will still beat her when he wants. And if she's unhappy, she cannot get divorced. It is culturally unacceptable to get divorced. So you have to understand there is no release for these women, okay? And and to even identify, for one of these women to even identify that they're with, with, with the fact that they're unhappy is huge because most of these women just accept their fate as, as this is my fate as a woman in Afghanistan. And for someone to say, I am unhappy, I want to die, that is huge. And they, they take those, you know, the only, the only tools they have to, to access is cooking fuel. They don't have guns. They don't have a, so they burn themselves. You know, they have matches and they have cooking fuel mm -hmm. because they cook. That's it. So it has nothing to do with wanting to make their husbands feel bad. They don't. They're not that modernist thinking. I mean, they're not. These are women who want to escape their lives. They're miserable. And I've interviewed for ten years thousands of women in Afghanistan. So I can I can speak with some sort of authority. I think. Well, I I, I and on the other <clears throat> thing too, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but um, Karzai's wife, for example, I mean, if she, like you said, would come out and do stuff, I think people like that that are in positions of power that are women, 
if more women like yourself too that are doing this that have this i think that is yeah you that will make a huge difference mm -hmm. you're right mm -hmm. huge but the, a lot of the men won't allow it but i think also i mean you're talking about um I mean, you know really big issues which are about kind of the um the nature of oppression mm -hmm. and uh inequity and, um, I mean, look, if you look in this country, it's only been several decades since it's been illegal to rape your own wife. Um, so, um, you know, we can point other places in the country, but I think, you know, you're talking about um, oppressive power structures. Um, you know, you don't want to take your argument further and blame slavery on the slaves, right? Or, um, you know, violence against women on the women. And so you're really talking about huge power structures that are set up um, to oppress people and um, reinforce inequitable um, and often violent systems. And so you're really talking about very big ideas that are very important. And the question you ask is one that people do ask. And it really is important to look at that because there are examples of people who overcome great oppression. And then there's always the examples of um, human beings who actually peril in those situations. And so why does that happen and how does that happen? But I think a more important question is um, what kind of risk we're all willing to take in terms of dismantling that power structure. Um, and 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 as large societies, as small communities, what are we willing to actually give up to dismantle those power structures that, that um, have one of the goals is, is that kind of oppression. So the question you're asking is something that's been asked for a long, long time. Um, but it is important to think about, um, you know, kind of continuing your, your question and then thinking, applying it in, in multiple situations historically and kind of seeing where that actually has relevance. Yeah, your question really underlines the need for presentations like this, uh, informing and, and engaging, uh, uh, because we, again, are so disconnected. Uh, we live in a society where, where our voices can be heard. Uh, the, the larger questions of, of uh, victimization and, and, and oppression uh, that Jane has mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm re when you asked your question, I'm reminded of all the questions I used to get in the late 1960s and early 1980s, uh, 1970s and early 1980s when I was very, very involved in South Africa and its, uh, and, and, and its uh, tragedy there uh, of Americans saying to me quite seriously, quite straight-faced, but the blacks are in the majority. Why don't they just rise up and take over? And you would try to explain <laughs> meticulously why that's just not quite possible. Uh, but, but it really is a really broad question that, uh, that, that we as Americans in particular need to, to have a greater understanding of. I see a couple of hands up again, right here. And then we'll let the lady in the blue uh, take, yeah, two, two questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, stop on the way down. We'll have three more questions. That's going to have to be it. <laughs> I, okay, this is going back a little bit towards uh, we'll your discussion of reaching middle America. Um, and I was just wondering, in terms of photographs, if you're in Afghanistan versus the DRC, um, and in the US, a lot of people have relatives who are uh, in Afghanistan or, you know, um, versus in DRC. And I wonder, how do you think um, those photographs, depending on where they're taken, uh, touch people differently? And how can you utilize that knowledge, I suppose? Or, or make photographs of the DRC uh, more significant to people in middle America? Let me use the prerogative of chair and let us ask all three questions and try to, uh, to, to loop them together as we, as we can. Hi, um, a question for Lindsay mainly. I'm not sure how many other photographers are in the room. Um, I'm trying to make that transition from NGO work um, into photography. I would love to hear a little bit about your career progression. I noticed from the bio, there's no sort of formal photography training, just how you started, how your career progressed, how you survived in that industry to the position where you find yourself now. Thanks. Okay, and from our UN. The last word. Um, pulling up on some of the threads that we've said, I, it, it struck me as when my 80 something year old father watched Anderson Cooper report from the Congo, and my dad has no idea what I do for a living, said, how come you in the UN aren't giving all these women guns? Why aren't you arming them? Like, to him, that was like the strategy. So I had to explain. And you're like, oh, right. Now I can go down to part-time. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> 
but um, I could riff on that in very inappropriate ways. But anyway, um, but I guess uh, for me, Lindsay, in the National Geographic, I hope everyone gets a copy of the National Geographic that was from last month, which has some of these images in it. And for me, the picture at the end where you're on the boat with all the Afghan women and um, what a picture of joy that is. And I guess if you have any time in the last minutes to talk about the privilege you have of those 10 years and the relationships, how the women see you and do they want to become photographers or do they, what are their dreams and what is their reality in terms of what they see as possible? Okay, let's consider these closing remarks, responding to the three questions and anything else you want to say. <laughs> um, I will start. Uh, so the audiences. I think that when I do a story in Afghanistan, my target audience is middle America and families that have um, have troops over there. And so I'm going to be directing my, my attention to those families because I, and, and the rest of America, but really I know that, that that's the audience. In terms of the DRC, I think to try and get someone in Indiana or Kansas or interested in the DRC is going to be hard. I mean, this, there's an economic recession in America, and to be realistic, most American families are worried about putting food on their own table. So I think, you know, you have to understand the, 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 the audience and figure out who you're targeting towards. Um, I think uh, for my personal background, I studied international relations, and I never studied photography. I did it always as a hobby, and in fact, I I had no, when I was younger, I looked at photographers who were sort of my age or older, and they were always like trust fund kids who had no direction, and they thought, well, I'll just be a photographer. <laughs> so I never, I never was interested in being a photographer. But when I, I come from a very artistic family, and I realized that photogra photojournalism was a way of telling stories, and that you could tell stories with images and it was sort of equally as powerful as telling stories with words and so that's when I, I I've never taken a class so I've always just had very good mentors and taught myself and and just did it I mean I think the best way to learn it's one of the professions where you can just do it and that's the best way to learn um, Women in Afghanistan think I'm insane. They think, you know, for years the only question they asked me is, are you married and do you have children? And I always said no. I was just married last year. Um, and for them, a woman, I'm 37, and for them to see a woman past 18 years old who didn't already have a, a kid was astonishing. They think I have a lonely, miserable life. Um, you know, the whole life, the whole system revolves around family in Afghanistan. And so, you know, I would joke around with them a lot and say my husband's pregnant or I, I earn the money and my husband stays at home. And, you know, they never understood. But I always joke around with them and, and just say in my country, women are equal to men. And in my country, you know, and I and I say that a lot. And I do I do sort of express to them that there are other countries outside of Afghanistan that are very different. But I, I do understand that they, it's hard for them to conceive of that. Jane, closing remarks. I just want to thank you for uh, having me here. And I want to thank all of you for um, the work that you do. We, we got a list just right before we came in of um, some of you who are here. And um, it's incredibly impressive. And, and thank you for um, giving two hours of your time um, to come here and, and talk with us. Well, let us thank these two remarkable women. Thank you.